Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'll sort of assume that most of you don't know who, who Feather and Bone is or what, what we do. So I'll give you a brief sort of outline. Today I'm sort of focusing on, on farmers' stories because I'm figuring I'm talking to lots of farmers here. But I suppose whether you're planning to you know, market directly and, and that's sort of what I'm talking about a bit, what I'm really thinking about is whether you're marketing directly or not, you still need a sort of coherent narrative about what you're producing and why you're producing it. And obviously a lot of the presenters today have a very clear, clear sort of narrative about that. Um, it's sort of vital to be able to communicate that to yourself as much as the people around you. And if you know that, you can start to make really sort of powerful decisions. So uh, it's already been, a few of these things have already been covered, but so 17 years, um, what I was really interested in is I come from a sort of a sommelier background, so I was, I was sourcing wine. And it's very sort of customary with, with wine that you sort of be able to, to, to tell the story of how it was produced, where it was produced, uh, what varieties you might have been in the wine, and all of that sort of detail is expected. But very re rarely was that sort of um, in the food that we were buying in, in the restaurants that I was working. Uh, and certainly not to do with livestock. So lamb was just lamb and it sort of had absolutely no connection to, to what breed it was, even though there's, what, 350 breeds of lamb in the world and it was never differentiated by breed, which I thought was sort of curious. So I was trying to sort of bring that to it, but also the value of actually being able to, to talk to producers. From visiting vineyards, you get a very clear sense of what people are doing. And because they're generally small farms and vineyards are you know, just, just farms like anything else, the borders of them are much more apparent. So you can sort of see the differences between sort of how people produce, you know, uh, manage their vines uh, very clearly. Where in bigger farms, especially around here, where you might be talking about 3,000 acres, those borders are sort of much more, well, far flung clearly, but also much more indistinct. Uh, so visiting the farm became sort of central to what we wanted to do. We also wanted to buy whole bodies, which is sort of doesn't sound like much, but is actually a very big difference in the way most butchers work and the way we work. Uh, by buying whole carcass, we can, one, let the producer concentrate on what they do well, which is actually producing livestock, uh, but also it takes the responsibility where it should be, and that's on to us to sort of then deal with the whole carcass. It is, it's, it's sort of the basis of this is a sort of an idea of respect. That's all. Uh, is an idea of respect. If you're going to kill an animal to eat it, you've really got to take responsibility for that decision. And the idea that you just sort of buy smaller and smaller parts that are more and more anonymous. I think that distance from, from food and what's produced really bothered me. And um, working in restaurants where people say, I'll have the whole fish, but I don't want the head. You know, I don't want it looking at me. And I sort of think that's, that is just such a cop out, really. You're going to kill, kill something to eat it. The least you can do is acknowledge that it was a whole creature. Um, so we only buy whole carcasses, which, which is sort of a constant battle because, as you know, beef are pretty big and the ones we buy are around 300 to 350 kilos each. That's a lot of different things to get rid of and I suppose we've spent 17 years practising how to do that. Uh, we're better at it now than we certainly were when we started and we have a lot more sort of different avenues for the way we sort of deal with that through an in-house commercial kitchen which produces lots of uh, finished products and also cooks down bones for broth and various things. Uh, right through to the prime cuts, which obviously are pretty easy to sell. Uh, you know, people come in and they say, oh, look, I want some eye fillet, and most of the time we would sort of say to them, well, we can't really do that, we haven't got any left. And uh, most butchers would just get another box open, right? So it does require a discipline that you're prepared to say no to people, but also sort of it's, a poss it's a, an opportunity for education as well. Uh, you know, out of that body of 350 kilo body of beef, say you're going to get about if you're lucky, five kilos of, of eye fillet, which is about 1.3, 1.2% of the body weight, which is about how often you should eat it. But most people would not like that to be sort of the, the challenge that they're presented with when they've gone into the shop to buy something. But, you know, that's what we do. Uh, we were very focused on rare breeds of livestock when we started. Uh, the reason for that was that a lot of them seemed to be dying out. And we thought that was sort of, uh, there was a real concern around that lack of lack of genetic diversity, not just in, in livestock, but also in, in all, all sorts of farming crops, uh, uh, vegetables, legumes, grains. Um, that's our sort of common inheritance and what we were sort of prepared to do and, and still are, and it's sort of a, it's an issue that um, is ongoing, is seed control of all those genetics to private companies. And 
on the whole, they haven't got our interests at heart, or certainly haven't got the interests of feeding the world equitably at heart. Uh, I think of them as the pornographers of food, really. They're trying to give you the lowest common denominator of, of, of what's going on. Uh, and it's always focused on one single, single idea, which is that weight is the only sort of valuable com uh, trait in that um, commodity. And to us, that's, that's a real problem. So we're always trying to recalibrate value. Um, working with systems, uh, farmers that worked with uh, natural systems of fertility and minimising packaging. It's one of the nice things about buying whole carcass. It's probably the last thing in the world that comes completely unwrapped. It's the, probably the only thing in the world that still comes unwrapped. Uh, of course, that's changing because abattoirs now are becoming the butcher shops of the past. So the breaking is happening at the abattoir level and uh, what's, being, what's coming out of the abattoirs is already boxed and packed. And certainly that works when you're looking at it purely from a logistics point of view and you can put it, carry it with a, a forklift uh, rather than some guy throwing a 90 kilo hindquarter over his shoulder. Uh, but it's at the cost of a whole range of other things. Uh, Supplier list terribly cropped, I apologise for that, uh, but it does give you a sort of a sense of what we would have in the shop at any one time. Um, so, you know, we would say there's four different sorts of, uh, of beef there. Um, they're at also at different ages, so, you know, some of that would be four weeks old, some would be two weeks old, some would be one week old. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's a very sort of typical week. Um, and you can see that most of it's from New South Wales. Occasionally I'll go further afield. That English longhorn is from Tasmania. Um, but that's because there's no other English longhorn that I know of in uh, mainland Australia. And I'm really interested in the way they're, they're, they're working and with that particular breed. Um, not all of it is old breeds, as you can see. Speckle Park, relatively recent, 30 years or so. Uh, we, you know, we'd also find Dorpers in there um, and Australian Whites, you know, again, a relatively recent breed, but they do, they do bring something that's sort of really important. But in amongst that, there will be Ryland. Uh, Lazy Farmer Mixed Breed, that's uh, Bruce uh, Maynard, who some of you might know from uh, Narromine, um, Bob Hawke Farmer, the Landcare Farmer of the Year. We'll get to him in a moment. Um, and we also do a range of other things because what we're really interested in is approach. So we also do a fair bit of dairy, garlic, olive oil, things like that. Um, this is sort of how we see ourselves. We operate at the, at the cross section between and the intersection between all these people. So while we provide a, <coughs> excuse me, provide a contact between producer and consumer, although I don't like to think of them as consumers because they're active participants in the production process just as much as, as any other of the parts. We also provide lateral connection, so often producers talk to, to each other through us and make contact with each other through us. And for, that's, that's sort of something I'm particularly sort of pleased with, that we can act as, as a hub for communication. Because often, this, you know, farmers are dealing with the same problems um, all the time. They, obviously, the, the specificity of their location is, is very important. But if they're dealing with pigs, say, and pastured pigs, there's not that many pastured pig producers in Australia. And so it's a network that really needs to be strengthened and sort of supported. Um, and I think the third point is probably, you know, almost the most important point in a way. That's sort of what drives us. Uh, that in the impoverishment is around access to good quality food and, and community. And that the basis of that is what strengthens everything. Food is for us is the, is the vehicle for the conversation of why people come together and how they come together. And if you sort of look at food, it's the perfect way of understanding how society organises itself and what it values too. You know, who gets to grow it? Who, how is it distributed? Who gets to consume it at the other end? I mean, they're all, if you can answer those questions, you'll understand what a society values. Um, and looking the animal in the eye, which is really that sort of respect idea. You know, I, I go to farms a lot and often I'm looking at animals that one week later will be uh, coming as carcasses. I've got to sort of be able to literally look the animal in the eye and say, we're going to do the best we possibly can by that animal because it, I can see with the care that's been taken, taken with it up to that point and we're going to use it as thoroughly and as fully as we can. Oh, just a pig that I like to look in the eye, fantastic. Um, I mean, I just love pigs, right? They're just an extraordinary creatures. Uh, and we have no real picture of pigs outside. You know, the, if you see pigs outside, they're usually feral, right? Around here, you're going to be worried about them because they're coming over the fence. And, uh, you know, this is a friendly boar. Um, 
these are the questions that we deal with all the time. And, you know, probably as producers, you have to think about them too, clearly. But, um, and now, of course, should we be eating meat at all? You know, that's, that's the crucial thing. And if we are going to eat it, what, you know, how much are we going to eat? Um, I think we're sort of losing that argument. I think we're losing that argument. I think there's the, the assumption, the common assumption is we should be eating a lot less, and that's probably true. I mean, if you look at the industrial production of meat, there's enormous cost to that. But, you know, we, the, the unanswered question is if you're going to not eat as much meat, what are you going to eat and how is it produced? I, I don't mind what sort of diet choices you make as long as you have the same in interrogation of how those, those, those products are produced. And broad scale agriculture, as well, we've heard of good examples today, right? Um, and I thought that was really sort of interesting talk about, about you know, how we're going to address grain production in, in, in a meaningful way, because that's, you know, that's, where the, that's the highest chemical use in agriculture right now. Um, that would just be a classic photo that you would be familiar with, you know, one producer on one side. This, is, this was taken pretty much at the height of the drought, and that's sort of our organic wagyu producer on the left. Um, <coughs> they've got another photo actually which shows what's happened since then and the recovery period and this would be very familiar to the recovery period is so much slower on the right hand side uh, you know the biology was still there it was you know obviously a lot of that grass was dead but it was still obviously performing a really crucial function uh, we do a lot of field trips with our lot we do farm trips every year with our staff and it's built into their contracts um, that we go to a, go to a producer, uh, that was the same farm, that was uh, Rob Lennon's um, farm, Gundui, which is probably about two hours south of here, uh, near Leadville. Um, this year we're going to a dairy producer actually, we work with um, Baradak uh, Buffalo um, Farm, which uh, is an award-winning milk producer and Russians who came to Australia about 25 years ago and sort of, and I get a few producers like this, they just sort of turn up and say, I've decided you're going to distribute my thing. And, and I sort of say, well, I, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with dairy, and so it's all right, we can work with that. So it's worked, it's been a great relationship. And in fact, it's developed, and I'll get to, oh, Kim Kiss, um, heritage chickens. So to go back to the, to the, um, the idea of, of uh, genetics, chickens especially, uh, you know, the sort of most hopeless creature we've got, right? They're a genetic cul-de-sac, the cob or the Ross chicken. They barely can't survive. They certainly can't breed unless you starve the, the female hens. Uh, they can't breed by themselves. They can't survive. They can, they're perfect in if, if the weather is ideal. Like they, they're great in autumn, outside I'm talking about. Uh, the chickens, the summer lads, which are Michael Summerlag um, developed from old meat breeds in Australia that were cast aside when we took on the new genetics. And, um, he thought there was a real value in that, being a chicken nutritionist and working with some of the big producers, so he kept those, uh, those lines. So uh, the Kisses, who are beef farmers, uh, largely, and also they run sheep as well, but chickens are now a part of their, of their mix of production. So their story is a really particular one. They, they sort of came to it by accident. They were interested in using chickens as a sort of a fertility bump uh, and another sort of constant cash flow in their business. Um, and then at that stage, Michael uh, Summerlad was running sort of a similar sort of system to the way breast chickens are run in France, where licensed growers are uh, growing them in, at different farms. He ran into trouble and had to disperse his flock, and so the Kisses became uh, breeders, which is a very different thing to just raising chickens. So they've got three operations there on their farm now. They've got the breeding side of it, which runs five intact uh, uh, bloodlines. Uh, the F1s, which are effectively what we buy, and they're the, they're the sale property, plus they, they got the abattoir question. Uh, they decide to build an, an abattoir on their farm. So the good thing about chickens is you don't need a meat inspector around every time you kill a chicken, which you do for larger animals. But Roger the Magnificent is just that. His forebears, uh, sorry, his uh, antecedents are still doing the job. He's now dead, unfortunately. And that's, um, that's some of his kids. So that's, that's the sort of the model that we're really interested in. In the summer, those chickens won't go inside their shelter. They'll just live in the trees. Uh, we get them at 12 to 14 weeks. We get a few hundred of those every 12 to 14 weeks, and they're delivered by the farmer directly to us. Last year, they won the National Delicious Awards from the paddock, which is an incredibly competitive, it's the most competitive section of that. 
um, as did Baraduck, one from the dairy last year as well. So it's extreme quality, but quality actually wasn't what we were focused on when we started. We we're interested in the qualities that were embodied in these creatures. And if it happens, which it obviously, obviously does and often does, that, that results in extreme eating quality, well, that's, that's well and good. But really, the, the, the choices that the farmer makes, both in genetics and land management, is what really interested me. And it shows out. So instead of starting from the idea of quality on the plate and working backwards, we start from the choices that you make right at the beginning. Um, I put this in because it's, he's a great producer and he's sort of, I think, probably the best at maintaining uh, ground cover while still raising lots of pigs. He's, that's, his, that's his sort of as much as he'll ever allow to be, to be eaten down. Because um, pigs can do enormous damage, as no doubt all of you know here. Uh, they're great interrupters. They're really valuable in the, in the uh, interruption of the cycles, but you've got to be able to manage them properly. And the, that's sort of how they live. Granite country, sort of just north of Melbourne, actually. That's a Victoria, the only uh, pig producer from outside New South Wales. Uh, Andrew Hearn, so his particular story, he's, he's um, from near River Produce in Hollisdale, used to be a vegetable farmer as well. Um, very hard to make money in vegetables, as you probably know, to grow them properly and, and well. Uh, he delivers to us, that's the truck pulling up outside our place. So he also picks up the Baraduck uh, uh, buffalo milk on his way down the, the, the highway um, and also delivers eggs to us from uh, Oxhill Organic Eggs, which he drives past as well and yoghurt now from the son of Ox Hills. Um, okay, so this is the abattoir, extraordinary pork. It's actually no longer there. They've, they've moved farms. Um, but they built the first small-scale abattoir in New South Wales. Uh, River Lee, of course, you know, 30,000 pigs kill their own, but this was obviously, he just did that for him. If you're wondering about this, rather, that wasn't his idea of decoration. He got all these panels from uh, Star City Casino left over from a call room. So it's rather bizarrely has all these sort of photos of women holding up cards. Um, but so the pigs were produced on that farm, walked to that, the lair ridge at the other end. He designed that completely and now sells, um, sells the plans for it. Um, Lisa McKenzie, a beef farmer from Gyra, so just up the road, um, she told that she was mad, so she called the thing ewe goose and um, grows really, really good geese. But processing geese is extremely difficult. You can't put them through a chicken spinner or a duck spinner. You actually have to wax them. So they require really particular, yes, just like that, right? wax and pull off in the same way that you'd be possibly familiar with. Uh, they've now moved to Tarwin Low, which is actually where she comes from. It was her partner's place up at Seaforth, up at Gyra. And they've just had their on-farm abattoir licensed in Victoria. Uh, they had one there and then they tried to move the whole thing and it's taken two and a half years. But two weeks ago, it went through. Uh, these are Bruce, um, Bruce Maynard's uh, sheep. And you probably know Bruce's story a bit from Landcare. So he's looking at a zero input, uh, no till, no kill cropping system. Uh, these sheep, I mean, they're a really motley bunch, aren't they? You know, like sort of very interesting. They've got lots of different African breeds through them. Uh, a bit of Dorper, a bit of Dorset. Um, it, through the dry, he just wanted to see what would survive. This is, this is what survived, right? And they, they're slightly strange shaped when they, the carcasses come in, but really, really good quality meat. Uh, zero input, and so the other day he came down and did a talk on regenerative agriculture day at our place upstairs in our, in our factory. We have a room for 50 people, a room sort of about this size. Uh, and we're able to serve his land and also a flatbread made from his grain that was uh, milled just up the road and also beer made from, from oats on that property as well. All, all of those things just off that one property and also with basically zero input. A really interesting story and I think, you know, sort of going hard at, at, at what it means to do, to do grain cropping and what, how you can in integrate that into a, into a, a system. Uh, we did these for a while, can't do them at the moment unfortunately, but these were just leftover boys from uh, the intensive industry which normally would have been killed, but they were grown out um, for, uh, for cockerels. We got them at 16 weeks um, and because that little, it's actually only a 10 acre farm at Landilo in the Sydney Basin, uh, had their own abattoir again, it keeps coming back to it with the ability to kill something on, on property. Um, 
they actually were a quail farm that got bought out by uh, a bigger player simply to put the, them out of business, really. But in the contract, which said when they buy it, as long as they said, oh, we're allowed to kill quail, but they didn't say any birds, so they started doing these, much to um, the buyer, uh, Chagrin. I'll just include that because he's a beautiful bull, but um, I'm really interested in those Angus genetics. Like we buy those from Western, uh, Western Gippsland. Uh, very small, efficient animals. Just, and you know, the cows are average age is around 14, 15 years on that farm. Constant ascending fertility plane, not particularly good pasture, uh, but it just shows you what you give up when you, when you start going for size. These are really small, compact creatures. Um, the ability to fatten on pretty ordinary grass is extraordinary on these animals. Uh, I love this guy. He's, he's, we've worked with him for about 15 years. Um, but he's 82 years old um, <laughs> with his 18-year-old bull. That bull is finally dead now, actually, but we're still working at this point. Um, Tony is an Italian-Australian. He comes from a very interesting sort of period of time where his older uncle was, was interned as an enemy alien during the Second World War. At that stage, he went back to northern Italy to, um, to manage cattle there up in the northern, uh, northern hills for the summer, um, uh, grazers, uh, dairy. So he, this is Comboin, and some of you might know, old volcano down near the coast. Um, he's, we've been buying his biodynamic, uh, first we bought his biodynamic eggs. Tony actually pioneered um, uh, mobile shelters, built the first one out of uh, just corrugated iron and skids and towed it around his property. Uh, he built that with David Marks, who some of you might know from a rook farm, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, and that's now become what you might know as chicken tractors or the chicken, chicken sheds that grew out of that. They were going to buy his business and instead just bought the idea. Um, anyway, Tony has been selling us, um, I mean, look at them, fantastic. And we've been working with him closely, first the eggs and then the veal. So we still buy biodynamic veal from him, what he calls vitalone. So it's, it's six to seven months old. Eight months, the room is fully developed, the cow's ready to, to let go at that point. 120 kilo carcass, but we don't buy beef again for two years. So it's a very different product. Mostly in Australia, you'd be looking at veal at 10 months and then beef at about 14, 15. Really, there's not a great deal of difference between those two products. But if you look at beef at two and a half years and the veal that we get from him, clearly a different product. One very sort of you know, herbal and still lactic because it's been on milk, uh, but they're ready to let go at that point with a, with a fully developed room and without forcing them and not taking them off their mothers, Sulemer, so-called. Uh, and there's the, <laughs> this is sort of where those chicken sheds have actually finished up. That's Hugh Morris, that's a, a, a grain farm just down the road here at Spices Creek near, Win uh, near Wellington. Um, we do a lot of these. Uh, I, I mean, I'd really like to see us broadening the base of the, of the layers. Those, those, those layers, you know, they're externalising their body weight every 16 days in A-class protein which means that they clap out very, very fast. Um, you know, but the economics of feeding, feeding a, an egg-laying bird, uh, you know, for where they don't lay quite as many, I mean, these are remarkable sort of in what they're able to do, but they're in a permanent state of hunger. It's, it's, it's a pretty hard situation for them. In this case, they're able to eat oats that have just say, been sort of randomly sowed in this sort of woodland section. So I'd really like to be able to do something around egg-laying genetics. Uh, that's the buffalo farm that we was, I was talking about at Burraduck. Um, so, you know, she, she's essentially an animal breeder, but her daughter is a veterinary researcher. And she came across buffalo in her research and said, Mum, I think you'd be very interested in these animals. They're, they've got very interesting sort of uh, biology. Uh, they're very efficient at converting what they eat rough ground into milk. Uh, some of you might know buffalo milk is pure white, and that's because they're able to convert all the beta carotene into vitamin A. Um, and incredibly rich fat, so super high in, uh, in milk fat. Um, I think most people thought she was mad when she started. Uh, they probably still do, but she's incredibly successful. Uh, so we've sort of broadened the base of this now so that we buy the male calves at eight months. Again, she does a milk sharing, right? So one of the few dairy people that shares the milk with the calves, they uh, put them together during the day, they separate at night, milk in the first thing in the morning and they spend the day in the fields with them again. Uh, but when those boys are eight months and time to move along, that's when we're buying them and now we've found, we've found a, a home for them 
uh, at Iceberg's Restaurant, and uh, we also <coughs> do biltong out of that and various things. And we get cows that are ready to retire as well and turn them into salami. So uh, it's really a complete cycle that we're working with on that farm because that's what they need to do to produce that milk. So it's not just a singular sort of activity, it's a complete sort of buy-in really. And it's, I've been really surprised how receptive people are to that. Just more beautiful buffalo, yes, go on. And one other thing, that's just an off-grid uh, mushroom producer that we work with, um, just uh, done from solar power completely. I mean, it's spectacular, isn't it? So that becomes harder and harder. That, you know, if you, whatever you're going to produce, being a, accessing an avatar, knowing where you're going to go first up is, is, is crucial. We did a large study, two-phase study, on the viability, feasibility of a mobile avatar versus a fixed site avatar on removable planes. Mm -hmm. And um, we have great results. In, in terms of being able to continue with that project, but there's been quite a lot of, was quite a lot of work that was done at that stage. Yeah, yeah the, the question is where are they going to go after? So there's the company in Victoria that comes and kills on farm, uh, but they buy the meat from you. So their model is based on them buying, buying the finished product and selling it under their brand. So we sell it under our brand, but it always says what farm it's from. We're sort of more interested in foregrounding the producer. The risk of that is that you can build a brand and then they say, well, thanks for that, now I'm going to do it myself. Um, we've talked about contracts and that's a really interesting sort of, you know, in thing, if, 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 depending if the, the size of the producer, if they're producing 2,000 lambs, you certainly not, we're not, we're not going to buy 2,000 lambs from them a year. Uh, but some producers, we buy everything and that's sort of easy to have an exclusive relationship. It's when you, it's when you can't buy everything, what do they do? and they want to sell to another market, but it might be that you're doing this promotion and your finishes up your competitor benefits from your foregrounding their brand, which uh, is tricky from our point of view, but in the in this sort of pursuit of transparency, you sort of got to just put up with that to some extent. Also, you're up, you know, you, no one really wants to rely on a contract in that situation. What you want to rely on is, is, is an understanding and, and hopefully what, what it's, can be seen by the producer is what we do for them in terms of uh, telling their story and getting their, 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 their story out there. I mean, for a lot of people, it isn't so much the financial reward, of course it is, but uh, often it's more difficult to sell to us because of the quantities we buy aren't enormous. We might buy 30 lambs at a time, a couple of bodies of beef, and it, it's sometimes easier for someone just to move, you know, 50 cattle off at once. and. Um, well, sometimes it's actually hard, but anyway, you, you can see the point. So scale is often often one of the trickier. Yeah, I think that's where we're running into yeah. principle and getting the right product to you mm. um, at the time, at the distance that, that, we're, that we're from. Yeah, I mean, being close to the avatar is the key thing. The carcass doesn't matter how much it travels, really. You know, it can travel for 12 hours and it's not a big deal, but you don't really want a live animal travelling for that. Yeah. In your mind, to what extent does the, the kill environment of the avatar impact on the, the quality of the meat? Yeah, enormously. I mean, you know, anyone who's been to an avatar will understand, you know, it, it's a traumatic place. And animals understand the trauma that's happening there. The, the reason I ask the question, we, we butcher our own, we have a butcher come to our farm and the steer yep. will just be in the yard and it's, Live one minute, gone the next, it's just happily looking at the pasture around it. Yeah. And the yeah. meat's ridiculously fantastic. Yeah. Well, most farmers will say that it's the best meat that they have. It's like that shot you saw of that uh, abattoir, the pig abattoir. Uh, you know, the pig comes around the corner and sees an apple, literally, an apple on the ground, and just said, oh, great, you know, and that's the last it knows. And it's just followed him in there because it's used to following him around the farm. He's the giver of all, and his partner, they're the giver of all good things, so why not follow him, you know? So why is it, do you think then, that we don't have a, a mobile avatar, like for beef, for example? Like why, is it legislation? That's uh, well, the Food Authority is now much more open to, to it, which they weren't before. Uh, the thing is, it's, you know, the logistics of it are really tricky. You sort of go to a place like Binaway, or I'm just not saying Binaway, but any, any regional abattoir, and there used to be hundreds of them, right? Uh, one in every locality. The trouble is that once the Food Authority goes in and looks around and they say, well, here's your list of upgrades, you know, abattoirs don't make much money. And so 
they're not going to be, they will not have a million dollars lying around to do all the coving on the floor and all the redraining and, you know, so that's sort of where we're, where we're up to. And so with the cost of the meat inspector that you require for a mm. mobile abattoir, mm. um, you know, if it's only going to be working for, say, three to four days. It's $500 a day to hire one. So when he built his abattoir, he also got himself licensed as a meat inspector, which sounds like the fox looking after the hen house, right? But in fact, what happened was that the carcasses were better quality because of, it was going out with his number, his, his abattoir number on it. And he was probably much tougher on himself than, than, other, produce, than other abattoirs would have been on that carcass in terms of condemning or, or what he thought was acceptable. Um, but he did a part-time six-month course, spent residencies at Cowra, so it was quite involved. But they're very systematic. They think about all the, those particular producers. They think about every sort of step of the way. And he, you know, he's a five-day a week. He said, no, no, I want my weekends to myself. His partner worked off farm. Uh, they were the most thoughtful sort of, how do you set up something that they can manage, never get it too big so it couldn't do it. He'd get one, someone in to help him occasionally, but basically it was operated by one person, the whole farm. You know, it's a very efficient model and it was just the right size. So it, it fitted and at first he sold locally and I met him years and years ago and I said, well, if you can sell into your Dubbo local market, you should. And then he, you know, breaking up meat into small portions actually takes quite a lot of labor. So in the end, he took less money, but he let us do that, and we just bought everything he produced. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. thank you very much, Guy. Thank you.